Good afternoon, everyone. It's really lovely to be here today. Uh, I'm actually from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, lots and lots of people of Swedish origin in my state. So I've been enjoying coming to Sweden to see firsthand uh, some of the things that I feel I inherently know about Swedish culture and certainly Swedish uh, food, arts, etc. Um, so I am uh, an innovation and strategy consultant and advisor, mostly to US-based companies. I am the co-author of a book called Jugad Innovation that looks at the approach to innovation that takes place in emerging markets and really how it's different from the approach to innovation in the West. And I'm an advisor to MIT D-Labs, that is a, a development and design lab at MIT that really thinks about how do we tackle issues of global poverty. Okay, and I often take these uh, lessons that I learned in India about the approach to innovation to help the students and others think about how they solve these big global pressing problems. So when I think about reimagining India in 2030 and when I think about what collaboration looks like in India, I want to make sure I bring up a couple of different things. Um, I think, Adam, you brought up a really interesting point earlier about manufacturing and is that the way forward? It could be. It may be. Things are changing in uh, manufacturing. Micro-manufacturing is going to change things a lot. Today, I want to talk to you about what it means if India became your knowledge partner. Okay, and very candidly, uh, I began writing about this in about 2008 when I started my research in India and other emerging economies, talking to grassroots entrepreneurs, talking to corporate leaders. How do we innovate under severe resource constraints? Okay, that's how I started my research. Actually, it was for Best Buy, a consumer electronics company, and everyone said, oh, it must be because they want to enter into the Indian market. It really wasn't. It was because there was a very forward-looking leader there who spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley and thought, you know, big problems are being solved in these arenas. Sometimes they don't have the resources we might hear, have here in the Valley. How do we actually look at this? And what happened is, when we posted our first blog on the Harvard Re Business Review online, uh, we got a lot of pushback. A lot of uh, comments, and I'm not generalizing about readership, but I will tell you there were lots of comments like, what is it that we're going to learn from these third world countries? That's the kind of language we heard. Now, that was just around the time of the downturn, right? So the, the downturn stuck around longer than people probably anticipated. And two years later, this essentially built my consulting practice and turned it into, how is it that we do that more with less thing that you were talking about? <laughs> okay, but, but I guess what I'm here to say to you today is I want you to really expand your mindset about what a collaboration might look like in 2030. All right, so very quickly, what is innovation? I'm just starting here because I think very often we talk about innovation. The word gets so, so used that it starts to lose meaning. So in the traditional meaning of innovation, if anyone remembers Joseph Schumpeter, right? This Austrian-Hungarian economist, he said it was the successful commercial exploitation of new ideas, right? So it's not just the new idea. It's not the idea in the piece of paper in your pocket or the prototype in your garage. It's the thing that actually demonstrates it finds value in a marketplace. So that's the difference between invention and innovation, okay? <laughs> so this is actually taken from a Booz & Company report, and every year they talk about the, uh, the companies that spend the most, the thousand companies that spend the most on R&D, uh, and I think last year was something around $650 billion. And in the report, what they talk about is really that, you know, people are looking for big breakthroughs and game changers, and often they're really not getting that, even if they're spending the money. They're getting kind of the incremental innovations. That means things like, I would call it the vanilla Coke of innovation, okay? So it's not really innovation, but we like to label things as such. It's a pretty attractive word to use. And I think we have to look a little bit more closely at what innovation means. So, as I was conducting my research uh, in India and these other markets, and I was thinking about how does innovation take place in even resource-constrained environments, I first learned about the, the traditional approach to innovation in the West, which is typically uh, more expensive because it's usually R&D driven. It's a bit more linear in its approach, and it's more top-down, so it's typically done by people whose job it is to innovate. And before I go any further, I want to say a couple of things. We know that Sweden is actually one of the most innovative countries in the world. Uh, we know that that's demonstrated by many studies. The metrics include everything from R&D uh, 
to uh, the number of patents that you hold. Remarkable for a country of this size. Uh, it has to do with the environment, the amount of capital available, even the programs in the schools where entrepreneurship is really lifted up and inculcated in the students. So I have to tip my hat to uh, the, the citizens of Sweden for that. Um, having said that, you know, I also was trained originally as a scientist in the US, and I will say that this approach that I just mentioned, that's, that's more linear, that's more expensive, that's more top-down, is, is almost diametrically opposed to the one that I found uh, in India. And I think it's a, it's a big problem for all of us, and this is why I encourage you to really think about countries like India, and especially India, as a knowledge partner, because increasingly we're seeing that customers really want more value, but they want more customization too. So think of something like an app. Right? Apps deliver a lot of value, some of them, right? Sometimes they're 99 cents, sometimes they're free. We're talking about very high value at a low cost. And I think that this accessibility to technology, I think Sushma was just talking about how this is actually going to change, fundamentally change the way that we all talk to each other, the way we connect, and actually who's starting to solve problems. So it creates kind of a, a big challenge for all of us. But the question is, how do we solve the problem? How do we actually deliver the higher value at a lower cost, and is it even possible? Now, one of the things I also think about is, you know, I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley myself, and people in those areas, many of them, unless they've come from somewhere else, and I think that's the richness of Silicon Valley, is they might not be used to things like not having running water, not having access to consistent electricity. You might have a science class and there might be one microscope for 30 students in a biology class. It starts to shift the way you think. But going back to that Silicon Valley example, if we think about how many companies there are actually started by immigrants, it's something like a third. Um, I think that's really very much about the diversity Okay, and diversity of thought, and when we put the different approaches together, that's when we start to solve really powerful problems. And I think this sort of mindset of frugal innovation is in part what India can bring you. So this is Ari Mashelkar. He's an a innovation thought leader in India and around the world, and he talks about frugal innovation, or jugad innovation, as I might call it, um, in two ways, value for money, so I think that's pretty self-explanatory, right? High value at a low cost. But he also talks about this value for many piece that I think is extremely important. So two things, right? So if you create things that are not only lower cost, you're making it more accessible to a greater number of people who can enjoy your solution, right? But it also, I think, refers to who's solving the problem, including who are the people we're collaborating with, okay? How can, we, how can we expand that collaboration so it ends up bringing more value to all? So this word jugad, I'll just share with you very quickly. So for those of you who have spent time in India or are from India, this uh, word jugad means so many things. And I interviewed hundreds of people across uh, India to understand what it means to them. And what I found is that it's really different. It depends on uh, where you live, uh, your socioeconomic status. There are many things, there are many nuances to this word. But, uh, and I would, I would say jugad is, the way I'm talking about it today, is sort of like the word hack. If I, I remember a few years ago, the word hack was kind of a bad word, right? You didn't want, hackers were the bad guys. Today, everybody wants a, to be a hacker. Everybody has a hackathon. Hacking is sort of, a, it's a way to say, you know what, we're going to quickly find a really good solution. So this is kind of what I'm talking about with jugad. So when I was uh, in India doing research with my teams, we'd often run into problems like on any project. Uh, some of them were uh, small problems, you know, like we couldn't get a hold of someone or they wouldn't, they wouldn't show up, maybe. Uh, the others might be big problems like infrastructure. How do we, cr how do we cross from here to here? Uh, we don't have enough budget. We're running out of time. And my team used to always say to me, we'll do some jugad. You want to try just saying jugad? Anyone? Jugad, let's try it, try it. Jugad, there you go, there you go. So, and I, and I kept thinking, what is this jugad? And if, we, if we're going to do this jugad, we better do it fast because we really need a solution. And what I understood was that jugad was kind of a, a very different way of looking at problem solving. It was really very much about, you know, not thinking about what we don't have. It's thinking about what we already have. That for me is, a, frankly, with my traditional scientist training, very hard to wrap my head around. So it's a way of solving problems even in spite of even really severe resource constraints. It's a way of being, uh, you know, leveraging ingenuity, being improvisational, and being inclusive 
in your approach to innovation. Okay? So in short, I would call it frugal, flexible, and inclusive. So very interestingly, um, I think what I learned is that Juga doesn't just exist in India. It exists all over the world, particularly in resource constrained environments. So you might call it something like Zizhu Chuangjin in China. You might call it Jua Kali in Kenya. Uh, you might just call it even System D in France. Interestingly, I think like in the US and other parts of the world, I would liken it to DIY. How many of you are familiar with that term, DIY? Right? Do it yourself. So I think do-it-yourself is extremely important because it reflects this spirit of solving problems with what you have. Very often, that could be a 3D printer. It could be the network of a community of problem solvers that you have around you. And I think it also reflects the moving away from big organizations to solve problems. So it might not just be the academic institutions, the corporations, the governments. Right now, now it might be the entrepreneur down the street in his or her garage. So we have to pay attention to that. And I wouldn't say we don't want to push that away. I would say we want to bring that in. How do we work together? So this is, what I'm, this, this is where I think the opportunity for collaboration comes in. A couple of quick notes about what are the biggest drivers of, in, of frugal innovation or jugad innovation. Scarcity is one, OK? Because when you don't have a lot, sometimes innovation in resource-constrained environments becomes a matter of life and death. Unfortunately, and I think um, you know sometimes it's about infrastructure, sometimes it's about access to affordable capital, and sometimes it's time. Now, when I work with my clients in the U.S., this scarcity concept—it's not—it's not all often there, not in a real sense, not in the sense that I saw you know with the grassroots entrepreneurs in India, and so often we'll give them sort of these artificial constraints. Uh, to help them push ideas forward. So, for example, if we're trying to create something, uh, a, a product, we might, we might not do a cost-out exercise of saying, okay, remove 10% of the cost. We might say, tackle this at 1% of the budget or 5% of the budget. Tackle the same problem, and it really starts to adjust the way that you think about actually creating a solution. Um, one slide that isn't in here and should be is this idea of diversity. Okay, diversity is one of the biggest drivers of innovation out there. All right, and I think, um, like I said before, Sweden is one of the most innovative countries in the world. I think my, my cautionary note for Sweden 2030 is the more you can bring in diversity of thought, diversity of approaches, diversity of experience, the more that you can grow that innovation. Right, because we know that countries like Japan are suffering greatly because of their lack of diversity. So Jugad, this is traditional Jugad right here, very traditional. This is Jugad 1.0. I probably just have a couple of minutes left, huh? OK. So original meaning of Jugad on the upper left, that's a jury-rigged farm vehicle, OK, that you just put together motors, chassis, wheels from kind of whatever you have. To, that's a Jugad. Just make it work, right? Just make it work. On the lower left, folks on the train who don't want to sit down, or rather they don't want to stand, they want a little more comfort, so they kind of create a, a hammock for themselves. On the lower right is someone I saw in New Delhi who was offering uh, some really tasty cappuccinos, actually, but he didn't have a $10,000 espresso machine. What he had was a pressure cooker, and he did a, a fantastic job with what he had. Um, on the upper right, if you've ever heard the term split AC, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what you do. I have one air conditioner, I have two rooms to cool. How do I solve that problem? All right, so, so that's, that's Jugad 1.0. That's the fundamental nature of being ingenious because you simply have to do it. You have to solve the problems. I want to talk to you a little bit about Jugad 2.0. Jugad innovation, what does that mean? So when you take that mindset and you start combining it with a more traditional approach to innovation in the West, you get some really powerful solutions. This is Carlos Ghosn, he's the CEO of Renault and Nissan. So he's the CEO of two Fortune 500 companies, which is pretty remarkable. He helped us launch our book at the Asia Society uh, a couple of years ago. And the reason I think he was interested in the book at all is he actually coined a term called frugal engineering. Mm -hmm. Thinking about how do you create high value at low cost for automotive. Interestingly, um, Jugad innovation, frugal engineering, all these things have really influenced him as a leader and it have influenced how they run the company, uh, how, what their strategy has been. It has helped them uh, really push their line of affordable cars and make them even more, more affordable. Logan, 
Dacia, it's been, become one of their biggest sellers across Europe. Where everybody's cash strapped, right? But when he went to India to visit Tata Nano, he told this story that day. He said, you know, we, um, when, when, we, when we saw what their numbers were, at Tata Nano, by the way, who, who, has everyone heard of the Tata Nano? It's a $2,000 car, and when that came out, there was a massive, massive pushback in the industry saying, you know, it's going to be like a bicycle or a golf cart, it's not going to work, and uh, they made it work. So he went to visit, went to the factory and said, you know, we thought the building would collapse. We thought they were missing a zero. We didn't understand how they could have the numbers that they do. But essentially, Tata Nano, with their $2,000 car that did work, certainly had its problems they worked through, they created an entirely new benchmark in the industry. So, and what I, my favorite thing about what he said is, is, is something uh, that I think uh, Mrs. Ambassador Bose Harrison referred to earlier, uh, is, which is basically you don't just, co you don't collaborate with India just to sell something, you're collaborating also to share something and to gain something in terms of knowledge. So what he does, he actually sends a senior leadership to India to help better understand this approach and this mindset. We'll wrap up? Okay, very good. So there are some other examples we'll talk about during the Life Science and Innovation uh, Roundtable tomorrow, uh, but there are multiple ways for these collaborations to occur. And so just in short, um, I'll just say, you know, what's next? And I think it's up to you to really think beyond, you know, what is your consideration of what India can offer you? So I think, I think manufacturing is an option. I would so strongly suggest that when we think about long-term growth, we think about sustainability, then we should think about uh, knowledge collaboration that's uh, deep and authentic. Thank you.